Hi everyone, it's Lauren and welcome to another episode of BYOB. In this series, I invite friends onto my channel to bring their own books and to bring their own drink. And today, I have with me the lovely Rowan Ellis. If you're not subscribed to Rowan, I don't know why not, because she does lots Aww. of videos on everything. What do you do videos on? Politics, activism, feminism, yeah. like LGBT stuff, yeah, representation much. in film and media. Just kind of That's everything. literally it. That's the whole bundle. <laughs> everything. So all of Rowan's information will be in the uh, description box below. And what are we drinking today? We're drinking hot chocolate of my own concoction so it's a lot of like various different ingredients I bought like an actual mix that I'd made to the house because yeah. I did it. Rowan was like oh we can drink hot chocolate but I make my own so I'm like I'm, yeah. I'm bringing it with me and so, then also marshmallows and whipped cream it's amazing yeah. um, I was like <laughs> delish I literally can't even get through the cream <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna have like a little moustache. Yeah, I was like, let me just get rid of that quickly. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. Especially for winter as well, to have something like a little bit warm. And what uh, books have you got for us to talk about um, today? So I bought three books, but they all are on a similar theme, which I felt like was quite appropriate, um, considering the current state of the world, <laughs> uh, which is dystopian novels. Ta-da! Obviously, George Orwell's 1984, classic. Uh, first Hunger Games book, Suzanne Collins, a uh, nice bit of YA. And then also uh, my favourite dystopian novel, The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. Oh, how exciting. And it's good, we can talk about dystopia, but we have nice cozy hot chocolate to kind of <laughs> make <laughs> us feel happy. Yeah, bring situation. some joy back into the world. So talk us through your choices then, like 1984, should we start with that one? So I feel like that's sort of like the classic one. Um, I think it's also, so I did um, YA dystopia as part of my dissertation and a big, big difference between YA and adult dystopia, especially within like the Hunger Games run of books, um, is that adult dystopia often has like a very pessimistic ending. In 1984 that you have one person who seems like they kind of break out of the system and then in the end doesn't quite go how you think it's gonna go. Yeah. It's not, it's not like in The Hunger Games where you have a big revolution and the main character is used as a kind of YA stand-in for the teenagers. Yeah, and um, then it's defeated kind of exactly. overall I suppose with the idea. Um, so like my theory during my dissertation was basically that like teenagers are in this state between the sort of innocence and idealism of childhood and the experience of adulthood so they mm. understand that the world is a bad place but they don't actually have any power to change it at that point and so uh, dystopia done in the way that hung the hunger games is can kind of be a weird self-empowerment thing so by having a protagonist which is reflective of the young adult that's reading it being able to go up against these oppressive systems it kind of s it s serves as a different like reasoning behind it than adult dystopia yeah. which is a lot about like warning people about current trends that happen. yeah like a like a like a, a terrible future that is is yet to yeah come. And, and it's a terrible future that like you have caused mm. so basically like dystopias are very often a continuation of our world like they are mm. literally in our future on the current like path or timeline that we're on right now what i do think is really interesting is that you've got and the handmaid's tale is really really big on this and atwood has talked a lot about it that it's all stuff that has happened already so it's not i mean like the idea of the, yeah, the hunger really games being like kids are gonna kill each other that happens mm. child soldiers are a thing dystopia is a version of something that's sort of already happening to yeah. some people in society uh so it's a very kind of weirdly privileged position to have a dystopia that you're like this couldn't possibly happen. Yeah, because um, a lot of it like, is set, isn't it? It's sort of in a world that we know in the Western world, like dystopian stuff. Like yeah. you say, Hammond's Tale is that's set in kind of North America as well, isn't it? Like yeah, you, yeah, it's, yeah. It's so it's kind of a place where you don't imagine these things happening, but they are happening somewhere else. It's just that we don't want to think about it or Absolutely. think that it could happen. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> <a lot> of, <laughs> where we live. Da, da, da. <laughs> Drink some hot chocolate. Like Atwood has explicitly talked about the fact that like all of the stuff that happens within the society is the same. Uh, hers is also interesting because it's the only one where you see someone from before the creation of the dystopia. So um, the mm. main character... Oh, like in the flashbacks. The main character yeah. was alive when it was a society that was basically the same as ours and slowly and insidiously things yeah. started to change. Whereas most dystopias tend to take place in a very distant hundreds of years future where no one really remembers before because it's a lot easier to explain why no one says, wait a minute... Why is this yeah. happening if you have like stuff like 1984, which very deliberately talks about propaganda and, and the use of language and twisting the use of language and history? It becomes like, oh yeah, of course, if they've been doing this thing where they lied about history for so long, people wouldn't know how to kind of 
contextualize what they're going through. Whereas with The Handmaid's Tale, yeah, it's only it's only one generation, isn't it's, it? It's yeah, like within literally, her lifetime, she, it, things have gone so far. She, it's like unrecognizable. There's a bit where her bank account gets shut down. She can't access any of her money, okay. but her hus- her boyfriend can or her husband can. And so he's like, oh, don't worry about it. It's a mistake. We're still okay because of this. And so they, they think of the immediate effects of how will they survive as opposed to being like, okay, but why yeah, can't what's I happening? access yeah. this? Um, and I feel like it's really, it's something that is, when people read this, often in very like privileged countries uh, that haven't had to go through this in their lifetime or even in their parents lifetime they often look at that and they're like oh this is so crazy this is so far-fetched and then you have a situation now where you have people from countries where this has literally happened where they were thriving metropolitan middle-class families that found themselves becoming penniless refugees and you're like this is literally something that's happening but it's seen as such a fictional world or it's like each step isn't major enough for people to go, oh, hey, stop that. Like, everything yeah. is kind of small, small, like, you say, like, insidiously changing. And then, sort of, 10, 20 years later, you're like, hey, how, wait, did, this how, did, how, did, how did we get to here? Shall we go through the plot of some of the books? Because I haven't read 1984. I feel like I know so much about it, because you hear it in culture, yeah. like Big Brother and things like that, but I, I don't even really Absolutely. know. 1984 is about a guy called Winston Smith who works for uh, a branch of this government, and essentially they have... You're right, the idea of Big Brother, mm-hmm. so always being watched. All their, their kind of speech is monitored, their sort of, their thoughts are monitored. Like, it's a very surveillance heavy. It's a lot about surveillance. Basically, he ends up having a love affair. So anyone who criticises YA for having romance and dystopia, like, 1984, <laughs> my like friend. the creation of a genre. <laughs> um, and it's kind of just about him and starting to break out. So he's very much not a character who's already in the resistance. Like, he's okay. a character who's kind of been complicit in the crimes like, of the government. He's like part of the system. Exactly, who then, then starts to break out of it and it's kind of how that works and what happens to him afterwards. Okay. When when people talk about Orwellian um, dystopias, there's a lot of comparisons to like CCTV when that was like a big thing that people were really, yeah. really hated, which seems to not be a thing people are talking about so much anymore. But that's the idea is of surveillance. And so when, yeah. when it's like people who can, the government monitoring your records or your internet history or anything like that, that's why it's referred to as Orwellian because it's very much a surveillance I see. thing. I love that there's CCTV because it makes me feel safe. Like on transport or when I'm walking around by myself, mm-hmm. I love knowing that if something happened, it would probably be recorded. Is that just because I've been but, used to it because it's been happening for a long time? Like, should I feel safe that the government could possibly access my Facebook and all of this other stuff? I don't know. It's, it's great if it's something that is only used for good. But Which then, power rarely is. <laughs> so. And it, and like that's the thing. If you build up a system with a fair government or with you know people who are trustworthy, and you build up a system that's based on them being trustworthy, and then someone who's untrustworthy gets hold of it or comes into power, you can't just suddenly be like, take all that away, get yeah. out of there. Um, and so with CCTV, it's interesting because it's it's in terms of studies about how successful it is in actually like preventing crime or catching culprits. I don't think that even matters, like, because it's kind of a psychological thing at this point that people mm. think of it as something that helps them and yeah, so potentially true. makes them feel better, makes them feel safer. A lot of dystopias are really interesting in the way that they talk about media messages. Like, The Hunger Games is mm. obviously a massive one for that because it's it's all about propaganda and, and compulsory propaganda, so you have to watch and that's how you control a whole population. Yeah, and it's not just the propaganda, but it's also the lack of communication between normal people as well in the Hunger Games, isn't exactly. it? They can't communicate with each other in other districts. It's literally just what they get from the capital. Mm-hmm. And then there's no other news. Yep. Mm. Which is... Oh, it's so relevant. <laughs> it's so <laughs> relevant. The Hammy's Tell is uh, being a Netflix series, I think? Yes. No, I saw... Like I think BBC I've seen, like, a things? promo for it. It's on like, somewhere. Yes. It's definitely being a series, and I'm That's so That's what it needs as well. Stoked definitely a series rather than a film. Like, it's really I did, like, they it. had the film before, and I was like, it's okay, but I think that it's definitely something that needs updating. Like, you, I feel like you need a new... Films get outdated very quickly. If it's a film that's meant to be current, you need to keep it current. Especially if it's about political landscapes, like exactly. Ham- Hamid's Tale. Like, you need something that's really relevant to people. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm so, so excited about that. So if you don't know about The Hamid's Tale, it kind of takes place, like we were saying, just kind of after our present day uh, period, where um, there's been some kind of war, I think, or people can't have children. 
like a lot of yeah. women can't have children so there is a <laughs> subset of women called the handmaids who are women who have had children previously so we know that they're fertile and they are subservient to um, a higher class of couple and they have to have sex with their husband in order to try and procreate and their children were taking away from them mm -hmm. we don't really quite know what happened do we in yeah, previous to the handmaid's tale we just know something went a bit off and um, especially because like the trauma is very raw for offred which is yeah. the main character and there's also no writing so everything is in pictures so you'll go to the supermarket and you'll just have like a symbol for the thing that you're meant to oh, pick I don't up, that. Um, which is all like control of information, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Which is why it's, I suppose, it's quite revolutionary for Offred to be writing, because then it's like that they find the writing exactly. that she's been doing. It's satisfying in terms of dystopia. Actually, it's quite interesting yeah. because it gives you hope, sort of how societies rise and societies fall and things change mm -hmm. and things don't stay the same forever, and it yeah. really gives you that closure, I suppose, doesn't it? Which yeah, is interesting. It's one of those things that's really difficult because you're like, it gives you the closure of like this, this thing will end, but then you're like. But it but it happens, so it could probably happen again. Yeah. But then it will end again. But then it's kind of this just cycle of humans are the worst. Yeah. <laughs> I, re I read something like once they were talking about the fall of civilization. I say once, like the other day. <laughs> um, and they were saying how it's interesting because civilization can always fall because it mm -hmm. fell before, like the Roman yeah. Empire fell. And it, it's, it's Plunged gone. us into it, the dark ages. Like this has oh. happened. Yeah. Um, so you should never be too... Um, comfortable with your position and just think society is so complex that we're all going to be fine because that is not the case <laughs> so cheery <Yeah>. topics <laughs> <laughs> they come to my channel for the fun because this is a situation this is like um a new um age really isn't it with social media and people being so linked we've not had this before when stuff's been going on yeah uh, exactly we've not had this um, ability to communicate globally like so easily so exactly. it's, an, it's an interesting time and like you were saying like in the books the idea is that communication is shut down mm. connection between people is shut down information is shut down and so when we have such an the opposite situation of that is it that actually you kind of do a version of shutting down information by flooding yeah, like information, so information with falsehoods and yeah, with yeah. like differences and separating out people because all the information that you gather online around who you're subscribed to or who you're following and your bubble means that you can just get fed one particular line and someone can get fed something else. So it's whether actually we're living in, well, this has got really deep, <laughs> like whether we're basically living in a dystopia where instead of having a complete shutdown of information, we're just like Winston and we don't actually realise that we're living in a shutdown of information in that we don't actually have information. Because you just can't know what's true words. and what isn't. So it's just, yeah. yeah. So how can you ever discover the truth? <sighs> well, <laughs> thanks for coming on, Rowan. That was, re that was really interesting. Thanks for having interesting me. Interesting discussion. And thanks for the hot chocolate. Um, it really helped with the with, with, <laughs> with the discussions of the topics that we had in mind. As I said before, if you would like to subscribe to Rowan, if you are not already, then all of her details are in the description box below. And I will see you in my next video. Bye. Bye. Thank you.